Uh, I have to confess, last week I, I had three points on the board for you. Yeah, three parts of what I was looking at. Um, Mark's gospel goes like this. Like 90% of the people who received it, we reckon, couldn't read it. And <clears throat> certainly in the last 20 years, people looking at Mark's gospel, Mark's studies has come up really well. And Dick Francis is very much involved in, in doing this. He's not with us anymore, but he was then, and he came up with this too. But we've got in Mark like a drama in three acts, and structured really quite neatly inside of all of that to um, make it memorable. So that people who live in an oral tradition can deal with it, and can remember it, and can tell it. So the three acts of the play in mark of Jesus' life would be in Galilee then after 821 where Peter confesses Christ on the road to Jerusalem and then the final chapters in Jerusalem where Jesus clears the temple dies on the cross his last days yeah? so those are the three acts and then inside that you've got like two sections to each act and inside that section two of which there are in each act it goes into groups of three. And I couldn't give you last time on, on the wall here a heading for each of those three sections. And it felt odd because you always get headings with me, don't you? Yeah. yeah. I worked it out. <laughs> I worked it out now. And here's how it goes. Not like that. Not like that. Like this. In each of those sections, two of which in each act of the play, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now that doesn't sound too catastrophic, does it? Until you start thinking like this. The governing ideas behind the, the, the plays that would have been seen in Rome, that Rome would have been full of, at this point in time, go to Aristotle and poetics. And in poetics, Aristotle says, it talks about this idea of dramatic unity. Now since these, these days, it's been developed from here, from a beginning, a middle, and an end, in, into five sections that the classic, you know, whatever, approach to this thing would give dramatic structure but at this point in time you've got Aristotle and Aristotle works on a beginning a middle and an end and that doesn't sound too catastrophic until you realize what's happening in Mark's gospel look chapter 3 verse 13 begins with the, the appointing of the twelve there are these people who follow Jesus they've heard the main message and the main message is the kingdom of God is at hand the consequence of that is repent and believe the good news and when you repent and believe the good news Jesus says express that then by come follow me fishers of men now that's the pitch for the kingdom of God. That's the message. How does it work out from that point? Jesus then takes those people who are following and he says, 12 of you I'm going to particularly take to be close to me and really learn the kingdom of God from me and the ways of the kingdom of God, the way of Jesus. Right? Come and be with me. And here's what to expect. You're getting the point now. Here's what you need to expect as you walk in that way. As you've acknowledged the kingdom of God is coming, as you've therefore repented and believed, and you've expressed that in following Jesus, here's what to expect. The incoming kingdom of God is not bringing a cakewalk and a party. It's not bringing it like whatever. It's going to be by faith. If it's going to be by faith, it's not going to be by sight. So it's not going to look like the kingdom of God is rushing in in power, and God is triumphant, and these people are having a party. Right? It's not going to look like that. That's what the Jews had expected. Actually, it's going to be by faith. We'll get to that by the end, probably. And the way it's going to be by faith is this. The kingdom of God is going to appear and men are going to oppose. So you're going to get discouragement and disappointment. You will not see a victorious marching into the kingdom of God, the Buddha the Romans, and everybody eats, you know, steak and chips every day. Right? What you're going to see is you're going to have to progress by faith the work of the kingdom of God and it's going to look like there's plenty of opposition so in this particular part of the act of act, of act one in Judea in, in Galilee rather in Galilee you're going to see this appointing of the twelve and what immediately comes of it opposition from the family from the family ridiculous opposition from the religious leaders they're the guys who are the custodians of the Jewish faith that that has been predicting the coming of this Jesus for, for, for many, many centuries. And, and, and that's all been worked out through the ministry of John the Baptist in chapter 1 of Mark already. Yeah? It's them that are going to oppose, the people you wouldn't have thought. And then again, opposition from the family again, in 331 to 35. 
It looks like it's all going to chips. And actually Jesus is saying, this is what it's going to be like. The kingdom of God is coming in. God is powerfully active. It is the right way to be walking. It is the right way. But this is what to expect as you set out on it. So, that theme then gets picked up at the end again. There's a unity, you see, between the end and the beginning. That's the way Aristotle wanted it. So, so you've got this opposition coming back from family and friends again at the end in chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. So what is this section about? What is this section of that first act of Mark's drama all about? It is about the opposition that you can expect to get, the way things are going to look as if they're going wrong, as you're going right and going forward with the kingdom of God. Now you're in a position to able to understand the parable of the sower. Now you're in a position to understand what's going on in the parable of the lamp. Now you're going to be able to understand what's going on in the parable of the seed growing secretly. Because that's what the section's all about. Do you see what I'm getting at? When you perceive the structure, it helps you understand what's being done and said. So there's the beginning. It's all about opposition from the people you'd least expect. And the way the kingdom of God looks like it's not the right way, but it is the right way. How do you then handle having to deal with that experience as the people of God walking in that way? The parable of the sower, the lamp, the seed growing secretly, and the mustard seed help you to understand that. They deal with the power of the word, even though it looks as if the word isn't powerful. And then Jesus does these miracles, which explain the power of the Lord who speaks the word. Although it doesn't look like it at the time. Because they're lying in this, they're in the boat rowing away and it looks like they're going to die. And then God comes in and speaks. It's the unexpected nature of the kingdom of God, the hidden nature of his victory and triumph. Does that make sense? Do you want to stop now and go home? Have you had enough? Ready for lunch? <laughs> I could do. I'm way off my notes, but that's the basic story. Can you see what we're saying? Yeah? We view these familiar parables and miracles. Yes, they tell us about Jesus and who he is. Yes, they tell us about his word and how it does go on powerfully in a hidden way. But we view those through the, the filter that the kingdom of God is opposed, that it is in a fallen world, that the kingdom of God is inaugurated but not realized. How do I explain that? You're a football match. The whistle has blown. Kickoff has happened. Neath, well, I have to grow up and become a modern man. Ospreys, right? Are playing, playing scarlets. The whistle has gone. The kickoff has happened. Have Ospreys played scarlets yet? Well, yes, because there's been play. But they haven't finished playing them. And that's the point. The kingdom of God is inaugurated, but not realized. And the rightful victory for Scarlet's has not yet occurred. Okay? So that's the basic picture. That's the basic picture that we're dealing with. That's where we are. And the implication of all of that is it's going to look like it isn't working. The word's going to go out and it's going to look like everything's come to bits. The wheels are off the machine. Jesus is Lord of life, death, sickness, chaos in creation, chaos in the cosmos. Okay? forces of darkness in the eternal realms right he's he's he is but it's not going to look like it until the kingdom of god is consummated at the end and what's required in between is that the just shall live by faith is that making sense to you i, I really want to stop there before I mess it up I mean, that's brilliant that's true. if we got that we're winning what am I going to say next? Is it important? Okay. It might be. It might be. Maybe I'll put that slide up on the web or somewhere. And then you can have a look at it and see what you think of it later. But if we're going to understand those parables, if we're going to understand those miracles, that's what we've got to grasp. They're being taught and shown and whatever to show that, yeah, hang on, Jesus is the Lord of all these things. But we're in that tension in between. And to show that, yeah, the Word of God is powerful, mighty, and is achieving the incoming of the kingdom of God. Because Jesus has already shown that the way the kingdom of God goes forward is through the proclamation of that message. Repent, believe, and what follows from it. Right. It doesn't look like that's winning. How do you deal with it? How do you deal with the frustration? And how do you continue to show faith um, in days like those? So Jesus appoints the apostles. 
back in 1, 16 to 20, Jesus spelled out the first implications of the incoming of the kingdom of God. You repent, believe the good news. That finds expression, as we said, in following Jesus. But that following has fruit that it bears. So Jesus goes straight out into the, onto the beach by the Sea of Galilee. He finds the brothers, Simon, Andrew, chucking out a net, fishermen. And they're hard on the heels of repent and believe. Jesus says, come follow me. Here's how you work it out. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. Here's the big new fact. The kingdom of God is at hand. Here's the immediate implication. Repent, believe the good news. Here's what follows from that as, as fruit follows from branch. Come follow me. I become my disciple. And then as Jesus' disciples, here's what you will learn to do. I will send you out to fish for people. What the followers of Jesus do? They fish for people. They make other disciples. Here's what we do. I saw something great from ten of those recently, which is a, a sort of a shop with good Christian resources on, on the internet. Uh, it's got a good book company behind it, I think. Um, I saw something on there recently, which is just a little book you can use and work through, work through Mark, bits of Mark's Gospel with somebody you know. Now that's the process of discipling other people, isn't it? We find a friend, we make a friend, we get a friend, we, we say, hey, you know, this is good, look at this. Hey, this is good. How about we have a look at this together? And this is how you make disciples. And this is the process. Here's what follows. From repentance and faith and following Jesus, make you fishers of men. Amongst those people, Jesus now selects 12, in a special sense sent out to learn to carry forward Christ's mission in this way. He appointed 12 that they might, from amongst those, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So there's, there's two sets of two in there. Can you see it? What are they to do? What's their service to be for the kingdom of God? They're to preach the word of God, to proclaim the word of God, and they're to release people from the grip of the devil. Simple, straightforward, highly memorable. And where does that come from? Where's the resource for all of that? They are to be with him and to be sent out by him. Being with him, being sent out by him. The resources are in him. And then to do these two things, to preach the word and to release people from the grip of the devil. Simple, straightforward, highly memorable. That's what the church is for. <laughs> it's a bit dangerous and radical, isn't it? Can't he say anything like that? That is what the church is for. We really don't want to complicate the mission of the church much more than that. As to be releasing people from things that bind them, proclaiming the word of God to them, out of the resource of having been with Jesus and having been sent by him to do this. And significantly, Jesus picks 12 people for this. Does that make any sense? Jesus has already spoken about new wine and, and new wineskins way back in, in the last section. Okay? He's already spoken about continuity and discontinuity in what God is doing. Between the old covenant and the new covenant. In the Old Covenant, he picks up, this is, I know you can board, but this is going to be, he, uh, he picks up 12 guys to lead the 12 tribes of Israel. And off they go, they lead the 12 tribes, and blah, 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 the rest is history, right? So now again, he picks up, in the new Israel, in the new covenant people of God, he picks up 12 guys to lead the 12 tribes of the new covenant people of God, yeah? No. <laughs> he picks up 12 guys to lead the one people of God in the new covenant. There's the discontinuity. He picks up 12 as before, but to lead the one, because what he's doing with Jesus, he's bringing all things together again under the headship of Christ. He's reuniting and making one new humanity out of the old fractured mess that was the world. Is that interesting? Okay, I'm interested. I'll move on. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get on to the next. He appoints the 12 to do that. And straight away, opposition from the family. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And when his family heard about it, they went out to take charge of him, for they said, he to his mind. You know it's like when you're working really hard, and your mother discovers you're not managing to eat properly. Yeah? yeah, 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 yeah. Huh? Could be a thought. I'm not, you know, but there you go. It wasn't in this case. That's what's happening. They want, they, people are flooding and flocking and he's doing all these things and it's, it's just, they just haven't even got time to eat. 
And this is the point where Mam turns up. <laughs> and she says, oh, he's out of his mind. He hasn't had his dinner. Let's go take him away. Poor lad, he's gone bonkers. And of course, the baby with the white ambulance and the men in white coats and all the rest of it. Your family were responsible. We'll take him away. For days of disappointment, for, for future, you know, servants of God and ministers of the gospel and makers of disciples, look at this. Here's Jesus. He's come to bring the kingdom of God. He's preaching the incoming kingdom of God. There are people being healed and, and, and you know, made whole and, and released and uh, all this stuff. People are flocking after the gospel. And his mum comes along, poor dab, we'll take him away. <laughs> now, can you imagine the discouragement? The heartbreak of that. Your mum is saying you're bonkers. We're following that Jesus. His family just can't cope with it. They can't see it ending anything but badly. They conclude that he must be mad to be doing all this stuff. Now if a stranger tries to dismiss you as being nuts, that's one thing. But this is his mother and his brothers. And, and here's another twist in the tale. It's not the bulk of ordinary people that have influenced them to think this way. Because the ordinary people think Jesus is brilliant. It's the powerful religious enemies of mankind's souls that have influenced his mother away from him in this way. It's the religious. We really must not line up unthinkingly with the religious. That is what pious Mary, we know she was a pious woman, that's why she was chosen and all that. That is exactly what pious Mary and her offspring have done. They've said, well, the big religious leaders are saying this, it must be right. And that's a trap. And the Lord must have been so hurt and disappointed, don't you think? Are you opposed in that way? After all Mark's told us about who Jesus is and about what he's come for, that has got to be utterly dejecting and disconsoling. I was in the mart last Monday, <clears throat> no surprise, and there was a man there who is just not a church-going person. The conversation we had was a tremendous and pleasurable surprise. Um, his pitch to me about spiritual things was an objection that, almost a quote, you know, there are people out there who read their Bible, they believe it. That's an objection. <laughs> so I said, yeah, that's right, I do. He said, oh, I'm not going to go with you. I said, well, you like, fine, take a shot, that would be a good time to do it. You know, we got a cup of tea, crack on. And he'd had all sorts of experience of people who were in uh, religious positions being behaving badly. Uh, that was one objection. But his big objection was, there are people out there who read their Bible and believe it, and how can you know it's true? You can't know it's true. So I said, let me stop you there. <laughs> what had happened was, he'd seen on the BBC, telly, on bunch of, you know, prof his expression, professors from Oxford and people like that, right, who were looking at the Old Testament and saying, well, we've got nothing else that will tell us that's true. We've got nothing else that will tell us that's true. We've got nothing else that will tell us that's true. And he said, by the end of it, nothing much the Bible talks about actually happened. And I said, well, I don't know where they've been looking, but they didn't been looking. And I could say, there's this and there's that and there's that. And of course, he had nowhere to go nothing to contribute to the discussion because he hasn't had the chance to look at it himself and therefore it becomes difficult and unproductive except that what he has got is these people who are in positions of religious leadership have said such and such and they're listened to because they are the bishop, the professor, the whatever and it drives you nuts, doesn't it? Don't drive you bonkers? Look what's happened to Mary and the brothers of Jesus they've listened to those and doesn't doesn't bonkers? That is part of what you need to be ready for. Jesus seems to be telling his followers in the inaugurated kingdom of God. Yeah, but what a difficult thing to have to deal with. How depressing and how demoralizing for the followers of Jesus who think the kingdom of God's coming in and it is. But even though it is, you'll get this. And that mustn't put you off or distract you from the fact that the kingdom of God is coming in and getting about its work. Credibility attaches to worldly office. 
and to personality. And it's a mistake when God's people get it that way. And Jesus spells out, of course, the illogicality of what these people are saying, which I tried to do with my mate the mark, saying he was casting out Satan by Satan's power doesn't work. Jesus uses two simple lines of argument. If Satan opposes himself, then he's finished. That's the first line of argument. So that's great, then he's finished. And secondly, you can only rob a strong man by overcoming him first. Overcoming, that's why I'm him, and therefore the kingdom of God's coming in. So what are you guys talking about? He's exposing the illogicality. He is undeniably, what he's doing is undeniably defeating all the power of the enemy by a power which shows that he do, what he does is absolutely not from the devil, but from God. And then Jesus utters this soul warning, do not attribute to the devil what God has done. This is the blasphemy spirit, and it's not going to be forgiven like that. The point that's being made, and the point that's being made in this context, is that followers of Jesus appointed to his mission should not be shaken when their obedience to God leads them into opposition from either the people who should love them, nor from titled religious leaders. Neither should they be discouraged that such opposition seems persistent and seems powerful. The kingdom of God is coming in. And then the family come at him again. Chapter 3, 31 to 35. The family come again. Mary, Jesus' human mother, comes along with uh, his brothers. He has got brothers. He has got sisters. There are doctrines about in certain um, churches with uh, um, structures and people who are this and they're that and they've got a fancy dress to go They teach you that Jesus' is, um, Jesus mother is forever virgin. He was the only child she ever had and all that. It's rubbish. It says in the book the opposite of that. These people come along and they wait outside. Why is that? They don't come into the meeting. What would the religious leaders have said if they started going along? You're associating yourself with him. They stay outside. They call him out. They send somebody in for him. They're not disciples yet. They don't believe yet. They stay outside and they send for him, trying to distract him from the service to God that he is offering. but he won't let them. They are his physical family, but currently that's where it stops. Now, family is very important. But his physical family is trying to distract him from his service in the kingdom of God, and spiritual family, he is going to rate high. He's going to say, ah, wait a minute, they're not in here. Look at verses 33 to 5. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. That is a very, very, very serious thing for a Jewish boy from a good family to be said. That is mind-blowing. Who are my, brother and, is it my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those sitting in a circle around him, and they're a right bunch, as we know from all we've read already. And he says, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Never forget the day when I was a Christian. I sat in the back of the, underneath the, the Baptist church in Monmouth. Um, very, very young Christian. I couldn't get out of school for the service, but I was allowed out to go to the young people's thing afterwards. And there I was lurking, waiting for them to come down from the service. And uh, reading Matthew 10, I think it is, where Jesus talks about those, uh, the man's enemies will be those of his own family. Gutting. Surely there's no opposition or resistance or distraction that is more difficult to deal with than what he's dealing with there. But the kingdom of God is coming in. We're not going to be ground down by it. So the background of the middle section of this part of Mark's Gospel has been thoroughly clearly filled in. It's all about the most powerful distractions from following Jesus that his disciples are ever going to face. Opposition to the message and life choices made in following Jesus. From religious leaders who should be backing it and from family. Expect. Resist. Because following Jesus you'll get what he got. And these experiences do not mean you've gone wrong. Jesus is preparing his followers for that pressure. Do you see the point? Rejection and opposition do not mean we've gone wrong. Even when they come from the very people we 
thought would have supported us. The well may mean that we've gone right because that is the pattern he's getting us prepared for in the service of the kingdom of God. How are we to understand and meet with that experience of the faithful followers of Jesus? That's where the central section now takes us with four parables and four signs or miracles which illustrate things. And I'm not, I'm not going to slow down. Because the middle has the parable of the soils. That's about preaching the word of God. And uh, you know, how is it that you don't get everybody believing? A very low percentage, a very low proportion of those in the actually come to believe and, and walk with God. The parable of a lamp, where, you know, a lamp is great, it gives light to the whole house, but unless you stick it on the lampstand, it ain't no good. It ain't going to work. How do we deal with that when the word of God goes out and it doesn't seem to have any effect on somebody? The parable of the seed growing secretly, well, you know, you need to know about that because we, we so consistently, we're talking to people and we're telling people and we're trying to communicate the faith and the scriptures and the message of God and all the rest of it, and you just see nothing above ground. Nothing seems to happen. That's fallen on stony ground. You don't know that. Because seed, precious seed, gets thrown on the ground and it grows away secretly. Day and night, God makes it grow. And you don't know. That's something we need to be aware of as well. Against the, discour the discouragements that can come along if we're walking in this way with Jesus. And then there's the parable of the mustard seed. You seem to have done something. You seem to have not scratched the surface. A very, very small amount has been done. The smallest seed known in the ancient world, the mustard seed, results in the stonking great bush, right? You think you've done this, but you do not know the bush that's going to come of it. Is that making sense? Yeah, we're going to come back to these parables. But you can see where it's coming from. You think nothing's happening. You're going to be discouraged in the service of the kingdom of God. Bear this in mind. The word of God may seem significant. It is powerful. It is mighty. That is the message of the four parables. That God's word is powerful, mighty and working. And then there are these four miracles that come along in chapter 435 to 543. The power of the word of the king, which we've been saying is powerful in the parables, it lies with the king himself, it lies with him and who he is, his authority, his power. And what you get in the miracles is showing that the God who speaks in his word is all powerful. Four miracles, stilling the storm. Jesus is Lord over creation. It looks as if everything's going bad and wrong and up the creek. They're all dying in this boat. Jesus, don't you care? And he gets up and he says, oh yeah, okay, uh, peace be still. What's the matter with you guys? What's happened to your faith? Now against the background, against the context we've been looking at, can you see how significant that is? And then there's this thing with the demons. You know, the demons can seem powerful and strong and people can be in a terrible state of affairs. Their lives are in the grip of the enemy of souls and you keep on trying to do something. And it's, you know, where is God in all of this? And Jesus says, get out of here. And the pigs run down the hill. Jesus is Lord over the forces of darkness. We saw him defeat the forces of darkness back in chapter 2. As he goes out into the, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil and he overcomes all the power suddenly in that 40 day conflict. There's the evidence of that. The devil does not have the whip hand. He just looks like it from time to time. He doesn't have bluster about it. And then you get that poor woman who, who is sick and she's spent all her money. She is now poverty stricken. She's completely broke. Because she spent all her money trying to get doctors to deal with her debilitating physical condition. In chapter 5, verses 25 to 34. And without Jesus having to do anything, without a word being spoken, she's healed. Because the power of God is so coursing through the king over his kingdom, that she touches him and, he's, and, and she's healed. But she's hidden in the crowd. Jesus brings that to light. And then, while all that's been going on with the sick woman, Jesus was on a journey somewhere. He was on, on the way to the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, whose little daughter was terribly, terribly ill. And Jairus is having to stand there and just messes about with this woman in the crowd. Come on, she's healed, let's go! And the inevitable happens. And the people come from Jairus' house. And they say, she's dead. She's dead. Why bother the teacher any longer? Again, you see, it's hopeless, it's lost. The battle is, appears to have been lost. 
Where's your kingdom of God now? Where's your Jesus now? And Jesus says, probably afraid, just believe. Interestingly, he goes off to the house, and there's the, the wailing troop of God, you know, the ones who come to the funerals to do the, the mourning thing, a bit like whales. And as they're gathered, Jesus says, uh, out you go, don't worry, she's not dead, she's asleep. And they mock, and they laugh. And he goes in with the parents who believe. Through all that mocking, through all that opposition, through that kingdom of God looking like it's pretty pathetic now. And the little girl is brought back to life. And they're so overjoyed and they're so full of beans and they're so dancing around. They go, oh, what? Because the kingdom of God is kind of broken above the surface there mightily. Jesus said, don't you think you might need a bit of food? It's been a long time. She'll be hungry. And they make her some tea. Now, for Christians in Rome, facing the persecution of a demonic Roman state, don't you think that one there about driving out legion is going to be important? People, through, the, through the, the grain crisis that are affecting the Roman Empire at this time, don't you think that bit about Jesus being the Lord of creation and in charge of their harvest, don't you think that's going to be important? Yeah, quite likely. And Jesus healing that sick woman, oh, the physicians were renowned for making money. Do you think that's going to be important? And at a time when childhood mortality in a crowded city like Rome was so high, do you think that last bit about Jairus' daughter is going to be important? For Christians in Rome at that time, facing the things that they have to face, looking at their faith and their belief in the kingdom of God, their trust in the Lord Jesus, but confronted with chaos in creation and chaos in the cosmos, the forces of darkness, and chaos in health and sickness. And chaos in the face of premature death. You know, you're going to be discouraged. It's, it's, it's not that Jesus hasn't turned up for work this morning. How do you deal with that? With Jesus, people are healed without its having to do so much as say so. The power of God so pulses through him as surely as the lifeblood flows now through your veins. It's just hidden. And he's disclosing it quietly. And there are times when following Jesus itself seems to leave us powerless and opposed. But Jesus heals the helplessly sick by the authority that simply runs through him. By his word of command, he does all this stuff. Even when the little girl has died. Mark's message couldn't be clearer. Circumstances will sometimes look utterly discouraging as we follow Jesus in the way. You're still following Jesus in the way. And as we proclaim the inaugurated but not yet realized kingdom of God. He's still the king and he's coming. And faith exercised against the odds is what's needed. Faith that is thoroughly justified... It doesn't always look like it. Beginning, middle, end, chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Back to opposition again. And Jesus having to persevere to discouragement and opposition. Where did this man get these things, they asked, as he preached his own his own home synagogue in Nazareth. Okay, he grew up in Capernaum, but he spent his early years in Nazareth. Right? It's the home, there's a lot of people there. Back he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? A, a, not Joseph's son. There's a sort of a nasty innuendo going on there. Oh, yeah, it wasn't his, it wasn't his kid. And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. 
Jesus knows exactly what's going on here. Opposition from those you would expect to have supported him is happening again, and yet he recognizes the ancient principle that's at work here. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, in his own home. What do you expect from reading the Bible, guys? Get it straight. Do you expect the prophets to be opposed amongst their own people? He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. There's the message for people tempted to discouragement by the na hidden nature of the power and the victory of the kingdom of God. Lack of faith when things look opposed to you leads to lack of reality and practical experience. He couldn't do much there. Because they wouldn't trust him there. Section 2 ends in crashing disappointment. That is what followers of Jesus must expect, running parallel with those signs of wonder and power that accompany the inbreaking kingdom of God. It's a bit like Doctor Who when there's a parallel universe, but not perfect analogy. Um, you've got things happening at the same time on two tracks, and sometimes you get a breaking through of one into the other. Does that make sense? Don't push me. I'm not an expert on Doctor Who, okay? But I've got kids. <laughs> That's how it works. Don't be discouraged by the things that you see because the kingdom of God is like the seed growing secretly. And his power comes breaking in to illustrate the fact. So the big ideas from the beginning of Mark's gospel are the incoming of the kingdom of God, the resulting call of sinners because the kingdom's coming, to repentance and faith because the king's coming back, and the life of following Jesus that results from repentance and faith. And this next section, Mark, from chapter 3, 13 to 6, 6, it prepares the disciple for not exactly being cheered by people whose support really matters to you because you've repented in sin and trusted Jesus. They're not going to be standing there cheering. It's his family. It's his religious leaders who oppose him for it. And that's what Mark 3, 13 to 6, 6 prepares the disciple for. And the central message is that things often appear different than they are. They usually do. And the follower of Jesus really mustn't be deceived by the appearances that are different from the way they really are. That apparent contradiction is where faith happens. Things, as we see them, day by day, go on as if the kingdom of God isn't there, isn't a reality, isn't happening. But it is. Jesus' word is powerful. His person is all-powerful over all those areas, uh, the cosmos and creation and blah, blah, blah. Reckon on having to live by faith in the reality, but the hidden reality of Jesus. That's the point. That's the point of those miracles and those, and those, those parables. Reckon on having to live by faith in the reality of Jesus. Now you go back to Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 and it, said, you know, it says this. The enemy is puffed up, his desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. It's back in Habakkuk. Oh, actually, we can go back further. We can go back to Sarah who laughs at Abraham for trusting God. And it's counted to him as righteousness. In the words of Romans 1, 17, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. Not by sight. Jesus is preparing his followers for that. Or in the words of Hebrews 10, when second generation, perhaps Jewish or Christians are finding it hard to persist because, you know, Judaism's got all this outward stuff, like the ritual and the ceremony and all that. They're finding it hard to persist just by faith in Jesus. And Hebrews proves to them that Jesus is better than the ritual. Jesus is better than the stuff you can get hold of. Jesus is better than the temple and its ornaments. Hebrews 10, 36 to 9, you need to persevere. <laughs> there you go. You need, this a word of encouragement, you need to persevere... So that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised for in just a little while. He who is coming will come and will not delay. And But my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. 
right here as Mark is teaching his followers who've responded to the incoming kingdom of God with repentance and faith have therefore followed him and are therefore going out to be fishers of men against all their background of the discouragements and everything else they're going to get he is training them that the justified shall live by faith and that faith is in the teeth of materially observed reality what they see with their eyes and he's training them to do it right back there